very formal announcement. Thank you for coming out tonight for an event at the Edmonton Public Library uh, and hosted by the Capital City Press. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Jema and I are speaking to you from and on which many of you are gathered is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground, traveling route and home for many indigenous people, including the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Bene and Nakota Sioux. This evening, we have a panel discussion about female-led fiction with our current featured writer, Jama Fixen, and her elite hand-picked group of fellow writers. My name is Charles Crindon. If you encounter any technical issues, just drop me a message into the chat and I can help you out. Uh, I'd like to note off the bat that you can enable live transcription along the bottom if that's something that's helpful for you. To introduce Jama, she is a US Today best-selling author, an Edmontonian, and a self-confessed history addict. She is the author of the popular Fairchild Regency romance series, and also writes novels with Regina Serwa under the pen name Audrey Blake. Their first book, The Girl and His Shadow, is available now, and the sequel, The Surgeon's Daughter, was released just last month. So I'll pass it off to you, Jane. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to join us tonight. It's such a treat to be here with you. Uh, I'm broadcasting from the Stanley Milner Library in the Makerspace, and so it, it's an extra treat to be here in one of these facilities that EPL provides that makes our community so, uh, so with so many, blesses our community with so many rich opportunities. Uh, I'm also thrilled to be here with so many talented authors, uh, Tracy, Greer, Julia, and Regina. And so if you'll uh, allow me, I'll uh, introduce them all to you if you don't know them already. Um, Regina, Saroy, and I are writing partners. And as Charles said, we write under the pen name Audrey Blake. And she's representing us while I moderate tonight. Um, but under her own name, Regina is the grand prize winner of the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award and an Indie Next List author. Uh, she believes in intelligent books that challenge us to reach higher and be better. She lives in Kansas with her high school sweetheart, two daughters, and their nearly hairless cat. Uh, Tracy is with us from Florida today. Uh, Tracy is the international and USA Today bestselling author of The Engineer's Wife and The Warners, two feminist novels I can't recommend highly enough. Uh, while working as a registered nurse, starting her own interior design company, raising two children, and bouncing around the world as a military wife, she indulged her passion as a playwright, screenwriter, and novelist. She has authored magazine columns and other nonfiction, written and directed plays of all lengths, including Blitz. Grits, fleas, and carrots, rocks in other hard places, alone, and fog. Her screenplays include Strike Three and Roebling's Bridge. Uh, Julia is our next panelist. Do you want to give a wave, Julia, or say hi? Hi. Uh, Julia was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She graduated from Northeastern State University with a degree in education. In 2019, she attended the Yale Writers Workshop and continues to study history literature and literary criticism. After teaching for 25 years, she has recently retired from the classroom to write full time. Her first novel, The English Boys, published under the name Julia Thomas, was a library journal debut of the month. A uh, library journal called it an entertaining contemporary crime novel about love and revenge. Her second novel, Pen Hill Wood, which is right here from the EPL collection, uh, received star reviews from Library Journal and Kirkus, who wrote the elegant writing, complex characters, and surprising conclusion of Thomas's second novel all add up to a fine mystery. Julie is married to best-selling mystery writer Will Thomas, who authors a Victorian crime series. Last but certainly not least, we have Greer. If you want to give a wave and say hi, Greer. Uh, and she is the author of the Fine Queendom series, uh, writing as G.R. McAllister. Uh, she also writes best-selling historical fiction under the name Greer McAllister. Her novels have been named Indie Next, uh, Library Reads, and Amazon Best Book of the Month picks, and have also been optioned for film and television. Uh, Greer is a regular contributor to Writer Unboxed and the Chicago Review of Books, and she lives with her family in Washington, D.C., Scorpica is her epic fantasy debut. It's receiving rave reviews. Um, uh, Arctic Fury, uh, her, I believe it's your most recent historical. Is that right, Greer? Yes, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, his most recent historical is out is actually about uh, a female uh, Arctic expedition in northern Canada. So I really enjoyed that one. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, so that's all of us. We're excited to be here with you. And uh, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but to get things going, we're talking about uh, women in contemporary entertainment, specifically uh, fiction. And um, so um, my first question to our panelists is, why do you enjoy writing or why do you enjoy representing women as protagonists? And uh, how is that per per personally fulfilling to you? And how do you hope your characters will be received by readers? And feel free to tell us a little bit about your protagonist so we can get a sense about what you are writing and what your work is like. Does anyone want to start us off? I can start. I have, uh, because I write historical fiction and I mean, there are a lot of us obviously who, who write more than one thing here, but um, my historical fiction puts women front and center in a different way from my fantasy. My historical fiction is sort of centering women's stories from the past to sort of show, um, and again, this is something so many of us are doing and I, I just love being here with, with uh, this group of people to talk about this uh, issue. Um, but taking those stories, taking inspiration from the past, pulling from real life figures, or if not real life figures, at least real life situations to say, women have been doing amazing things all along, right? It's not just, oh, after women got the vote, they started doing interesting things. It's these stories that, that the history books don't have in them because the women's history isn't as well recorded as, as history. Um, but, uh, we get to shine a light on figures that, that have not been put forward in the way that, that we would like. Um, in, on the fantasy side, and I wish I had my cover <laughs> piece, my- uh... I could hold it up. <laughs> All right, so Scorpica. Um, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> is, this one is set in a matriarchal world. So it's very different from ours. And that was really fun to write. And it also just, I kept bumping up against how male focused our current society is by looking at the language, by, you know, the profanity, like every, every aspect of putting ESS endings on words to make them feminine instead of just saying, okay, well, the word applies to everyone. Um, so I'm going on a bit, but that that's sort of the, the uh, two ways that I'm going about it. But in both cases, it's strong women front and center. It's looking at the roles of women and, and making it broader than just saying, well, a, a proper Victorian woman, woman did this because we all know the improper Victorian women are, are much more fun to write about and shine a light on. Thank you. And it's really fun to hear uh, because you write in such diverse areas. Uh, Tracy, do you wanna? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to follow on uh, from what Greer said, because um, a lot of the, the same reasons I've, I've always been a big fan of uh, historical fiction. And I, I think the very first one I read was War and Remembrance by Herman Woke. And, uh, and I liked it. And, you know, I, I kind of look at it as sort of history light. I was learning history, but in a entertaining way and, and getting to know the characters and the dialogue, dialogue really made it come alive to me, even though, of course, you know, the, the stories themselves are fictional. You're still learning a lot about, sometimes more about, I think, about the actual times than reading, you know, straight history, which can only come from things that are absolutely documented. But what I found was the, the women's stories weren't necessarily, necessarily told, uh, because until you know pretty recently, uh, there just weren't that many women's history fiction, fiction writers, and so the, those stories weren't being told. Because I think those stories are best told maybe by women, because they understand what it what it's like to sometimes be in the, the background and to have to do big amazing things, yet sort of hide what you're doing. So I was intrigued with, with stories that I could tell that just weren't out there anymore. And uh, so that's why I wrote about Emily Roebling and the Brooklyn Bridge and uh, Julia Stimson as the, the, the war nurse. Um, but the, the other thing- Tell us uh, who Emily Roebling is? 
yeah. for people sure. that haven't read uh, The Engineer's Wife? The Engineer's Wife, sure. Well, um, John Roebling was the designer, creator, uh, designer of the Brooklyn Bridge from Germany. And uh, unfortunately, um, was killed before the bridge was uh, even started. And he passed it down to his son, who was also an engineer, Washington Roebling. Washington Roebling, this is all historical, this is not the fiction part, uh, became ill from uh, problems in the construction. And so he basically turned it over to his wife, Emily, uh, to sort of go back and forth with messages uh, as they're trying, as they're building the bridge and he could no longer go to the site. So she started as a messenger basically, but he got sicker and sicker and she became more and more knowledgeable and involved. And eventually she was pretty much working as as the <clears throat> unknown and un, untold chief engineer. So I found it to be a really fascinating story. And then the, the one other thing that I really love about women's fiction and women's historical fiction in particular is it's not always centered on wars. And, you know, it's strange of my last one being named the war nurse, but I wanted to read historical fiction that wasn't all about wars and men's historical fiction tends to focus on war, war, war. So I wanted to find stories that were, you know, historical, yet not about a war. And in The War Nurse, I focused on the, the nursing, on the medicine, on the people, on the characters. Sure, it's during a war, but that's not the, the center part of it. And, and so that's the other reason that I'm really attracted to, to women's fiction and women's mm -hmm. historical fiction in particular. Leah, what is it uh, that excites you about telling women's stories? Oh, can you hear me, Julia? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you oh, said sorry. Yeah. Um, Oh, it's fascinating. I think um, I was thinking about it, um, you know, ever since I was a child, I was just so taken with strong female voices. If you think about the the women that, the girls that we read about when we were girls, and people like Anna Green Gables, and um, my very favorite uh, from the Railway Children, um, Bobby Waterbury, and her story, they, they were young girls, girls who triumphed, and I loved that feeling. My current book is coming out next week. It's called For Those Who Are Lost, and I have two female protagonists. Um, two, yeah, oh, yay. Um, I have two protagonists in this story, and they are two women going through World War II from two different uh, points of view. One is an in occupied Guernsey who sent her children off with 5,000 other children um, a week before the German invasion and occupation. So for five long years, she doesn't even know where her children are apart from being in England. And the other protagonist is the woman who, was, who took responsibility for those children and who ends up taking one of them. So we see the war from two different angles. We see how women are coping both in an occupied land and in a country that's under siege. So it was extremely interesting for me to do research. I hadn't actually planned to write a World War II book, but I was just reading a lot of World War II information. And when I came across some of the facts um, that happened during that time period, it was just so uh, moving to me as a mother and a teacher and just thinking about what would I have done in those circumstances? So I, I really enjoyed getting the opportunity to explore that. Really cool. And I like how you balance the two narratives. Regina, uh, why are you excited about telling women's stories? Write what you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm less prone to get it wrong. I, I think that the male and the female experience can be so different. Sometimes I feel a little presumptuous trying to, especially when my husband reads over the manuscripts and he says, nope. <laughs> he says, nope, that's not the word he would say. So um, at least when I write it from a female point of view, I know that that's the word they would say because that's the one that came into my female brain. So um, so I feel a little less prone to getting it right. Um, I also love fiction. I, I've read amazing fiction about men too. Like I, I do 
love both points of view. I am drawn to writing about women because their stories could have been my stories. And it's really neat to read about the men of the world and their stories, but that wouldn't have been me in any circumstance. But these women, they could have been me. So I think that's what really draws me toward connecting with them. So the next thing I wanted to bring up was the Bechdel test. And probably most people are familiar with it. It's getting a lot of talk lately, but does anyone want to fill our listeners in about what the Bechdel test is and what it means? I can do that. Uh, so Bechdel test is uh, applied to movies, but I think it's a good fit for any kind of entertainment media, including books. And that's, you know, the test that are there two female characters in a work? And do they have a conversation together? And is that conversation about anything besides a love interest or a man? And, uh, you know, it's surprising. And I grew up in the 80s and not a lot of, of media met that test. Um, and for me, you know, as a child, a lot of our imaginative play was reenacting TV shows or stories from our favorite books. And it was great to play Avery Gable. Uh, shout out to Lucy Maud Montgomery, a great Canadian author. Uh, but a lot mm -hmm. of the things that we played, you know, there's only one Princess Leia. And, you know, like all, you know, sometimes the friends we played with didn't want to seed us male roles. And so, you know, the only two options are Leia and Chewbacca for some reason, right? And for me, I think my writing grew out of the desire to have imaginative play. And, but I also wanted to be a character who was female and who was exciting. Uh, so, you know, what are your experiences? And what do you, how intentional are you about placing female characters and this, you know, if we, maybe we can start with Greer because, you know, a matriarchal world is highly different. And just to note, uh, re, uh, listeners, please feel free to add questions into the chat at any time. We'd love to hear from you. Greer? Yeah, the amazing thing about the Bechdel test is Bechdel test is what an incredibly low bar it is, right? Like just, so just, two, just two women, just one conversation, mm -hmm. just about anything other than a man. Um, and it was funny, uh, somebody on Twitter, I think Rebecca Mackay, uh, the author asked the other day, how many movies people could think of that, that would pass a reverse Bechdel test? So how many movies don't have two men talking with each other about something other than a woman? And I think they def finally decided that when Harry met Sally might work, depending on how you read the Pictionary scene. Um, <laughs> it was really interesting because the test came about because Alison Bechdel went to a movie with her friend and they couldn't find a movie that just passed that very, very low bar. <laughs> uh, so anyway. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, so, striking, isn't it? Right. So I think it's a really powerful fiction, measuring tool about, about how we, we populate our media, right? Right, right. And that it's not, and that, that there are wide swaths of the population that don't interrogate that at all, but we do, right? Like we're, we're looking for, um, women we can identify with, like Regina was talking about. Um, and as we write, you know, I'm very careful in my historical fiction. It's not that all the women are great and all the men are bad. And it's not that all the perspectives Absolutely. are women um, and that the men don't get to be living, breathing, interesting characters. Um, but I did make a fairly deliberate decision when I started writing the Five Queendoms series that it, so much because it's a reaction to classic epic fantasy, Tolkien, like, the big sweeping canvas where it's all male characters except for like a couple. And then they definitely don't talk to each other <laughs> about anything other than a man. Even if there's orcs and swords and, you know, dragons and whatnot, they're still not talking to each other about um, maybe the wheel of time, but, um, but a lot of fantasy is just so male dominated. So I said, well, let's flip it and let's just have a completely female dominated work of fantasy. And there are male characters who do important things and play important roles, but I decided not to make any of them point of view characters in this first book. Cause I felt like if I went and forced one perspective in, 
um, just to make certain readers happy, those readers weren't going to want to read this book anyway. <laughs> um, if there were, you know, 12 different female perspectives and then one male perspective, the one male perspective wasn't going to um, be enough. Um, so that was a deliberate decision, but with series writing, it's a little bit different because I get to continue the story and I get to expand it. And in the second book, there is a male point of view that's extremely, extremely important. Um, so I get to, to grow it from there, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to me that, that there's, that there are, are readers who just don't question male dominated worlds in the way that they would notice and question a female dominated world or a female dominated narrative. Really good I have to say, Go I was ahead, going Julia. to say that, thank you. Um, I was going to say that one of the reasons I think so many um, movies and books and everything don't pass the Bechdel test is because so much content was created by men. And as we're seeing more and more women writers, we're seeing like this group of wonderful women that I'm um, speaking with tonight and your books are so amazing and so full of strong characters. I think that even women women writers over the years have been, have written stereotypical women as well. And so I think it's really exciting to see people get out of the box and start, you know, start exploring what a real, true, strong female lead character looks like. No one else I'll chime any, in. Oh yeah, please yeah. Tracy. Um, I, I actually thought a, a lot about about the the, the Bechdel test, um, which I think when I was very first writing um, the engineer's wife, uh, I don't think it had really been applied to to books by anybody, or maybe I just didn't know about it. But to me, it was it was it was movies, but still, it was definitely in my mind because I had a, a protagonist who was a very a strong uh, female character, but who is surrounded by men. The, the story in the large part is about a marriage between a man and a woman, and she's working with all men. And that's, you know, the, the story so much. So I knew right away, like, I've got to have some women in there. She needs to be bouncing off some of these things she's going through with some other strong women. And we need, I needed some other characters. So I brought on, and historically her own mother, Emily's mother was supposedly a pretty strong person or an opinionated person, a society person. So I brought her in to have her sometimes have some conflict with uh, as well for the things she's doing, which was not accepted uh, for women of the age. And then I brought in sort of a, the, the, the socialites, the, the gang of women sort of that were her mother, Phoebe's friends, uh, and, and she becomes quite close with them and starts learning from them think ways mostly that they were actually active politically in other ways, but under the surface. And, and she discovers the things that women were doing that she didn't know about that, you know, that were just kept secret. And it's really enlightening to her, but she's like, you know, she's bringing out and doing things bravely out much more in the open. But um, it, it was, it was very important to me to have those relationships. And I thought about it very early on and I'm very glad I did. I'm glad that existed to make me think about that, about how important that was. Um, and in the, the, the Warners, a lot of it is about the, the nurses who were all women. So it was sort of much more organic to the story uh, to make sure that we, I passed that test and had a lot of those um, relationships and conversations and uh, sometimes conflict uh, between women. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add anything to our discussion here? Regina? I think it's fascinating. I'd never heard of the Bechdel test until <laughs> you mentioned it. So it's all brand new to me um, before this meeting. Um, and when you said what the criteria was, I was like, that's not a thing. <laughs> There's not movies that don't, like I really, I really thought that it was kind of nonsense. And so I went and looked it up and I was like, oh, this is a real thing. Like there really are movies that don't, and so I'm, I'm still in my, I'm still in my shock and awe phase right now. I haven't, it hasn't quite soaked in for me that, um, that there really are a large number of movies that don't have women speaking about something other than a man that 
it's still, it's really funny because that's not my perception. Like the reason I thought there's no way that's true is because that's not how I think of the world around me. I don't think that every time I'm together with women, all we talk about are men. It's not, it's not my experience. It's not my perception. So I'm really shocked that it could be all around me my entire life and it never soaked into me or seemed to be the way that it is. I'm just surprised by it all. Mm -hmm. In um, 2019, in the Harvard okay. Business Review, they said that only a quarter of uh, TV or newspaper or print um, articles and, and shows are female led. And in movies, only 31% are of the speaking roles go to women. So 70 or you know, 69% of all speaking in movies is men. And that that really surprised me. Only 23% of movies have a female protagonist. So I think that's something we need to do something about, especially in the literature world. We need to make sure women's voices are heard. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, I think, I wonder how much, you know, growing up with that, how much that shapes our perception mm -hmm. of gender and gender roles. Because I mean, as you said, Regina, like, you know, clearly, your real life experience didn't reflect the fact that when you were chatting with other women, you only talked about men. But in entertainment, for that to be so, uh, much the case in the majority of, of media or, or of movies and programs, it's really stark mm -hmm. and not an accurate reflection of, of who we are. Um, so my next question is, um, most of the panelists, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but uh, most of us here have daughters. Um, but you know, all of us have the privilege of interacting with uh, people younger than ourselves. And so, you know, what what do you hope that their experiences will be like uh, with women in popular culture? And what things would you like to be different about it than yours? I think it's interesting because I think there's already a big change because I, so I, one of my books is called Girl in Disguise. It's about Kate Warren, who's the first female um, private detective. She was a Pinkerton agent who helped save Abraham Lincoln's life on his way to his inauguration. Uh, and so, you know, in America, we get the, the Abraham Lincoln, you know, cliff notes <laughs> in, uh, at least in high school, if not earlier, you know, great president, freed slaves, got shot, et cetera. Um, but nowhere in my education at any point was there, oh, and by the way, he would have been killed on the way to his inauguration had it not been for Kate Warren and, and the other people that she worked with. Um, and when I was working on that a few years ago, at the same time, a children's book came out. There were actually multiple children's books about Kate Warren. Um, and I happened to be at the library with my kids the other day and out on the shelf, I saw, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, How Emily Saved the Bridge. So it's a children's book about oh, Emily Roebling I that I was so excited. <laughs> I'm like, hey, they're going to learn about Emily Roebling. I learned about Emily Roebling from a show called Drunk History <laughs> about five years ago, I Book's think. And it's I've never heard of her. Oh, my gosh. First of all, you have to watch Drunk History because it's great. And it teaches mm. you all the stuff that you never learned in high school um, about like Sybil Ludington, who was like Paul Revere, except a 16 year old girl. And all of this really interesting stuff anyway. Um, but I think there's already a movement afoot to teach kids a broader look at history than, than oh, we yeah. got Absolutely. Uh, women's history and, and otherwise certainly being much more sensitive to, to other cultures and to native Americans here and to, to first nations. Um, and that's really heartening to me. I think, I think there are just a lot of things that, that open up the world in a way that we had a narrower view and didn't question it because, you know, <laughs> you don't generally, um, or at least in my generation, we didn't. My kids question everything. <laughs> Both my daughter and my son uh, ask a lot of questions, but, um, 
but I'm really heartened by the, the efforts that are underway to broaden and, and to show history in its full breadth in a way that, mm -hmm. that we didn't get. Yeah, I, I have a daughter. Oh, sorry, go no, ahead. Go ahead, Tracy. I, I do have a daughter. And uh, for the, the part of the question that asked, what would you want for her? Um, I would have to say, like, you know, I'm as old as dirt. So, you know, when I was uh, coming of you age, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> I am, trust me. Uh, there were you no know, opportunities for, for women. Um, you know, it was the world was opening up to women. And I don't remember being told I couldn't do things because I was female. Uh, but it was there was many fields, especially the science, the STEM fields. There were a few women in there, but you were still pretty much a trailblazer to be in there. And you had to be quite brave and, and pretty much top notch uh, to, to compete. Um, but it but I don't recall it for myself as being a, a, a huge limitation. Um, but because it was opening up. And I think shortly after, you know, I was out in the, the work world, that's when things really started to change, you know, the 80s and 90s, when there was the expectation that women were going to be professionals and career minded, just as career minded as the men, there was no difference, they could do pretty much anything and were expected to do as much as high that break those glass ceilings, you know, the, the sky's the limit and you do, you should not limit yourself because of your sex. And I think that many women uh, who, you know, maybe about 10 years younger than me um, felt, and, and I, and to my, myself as well, my own generation, sort of a strain between we're still expected to have the babies, raise the babies, do most of the things for the family, do the shopping, keep that the family going, all very, very important things, all things that were full-time jobs before. And the expectation became that you did both. You had this wonderful, amazing career, and you were also raising your family. I don't know what the men were doing, <laughs> but this this kind of became a, an expectation and I think was very stressful for, for women. And now how I... I think the tide is, is changing a little bit to this. And I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping for my daughter is more of a sense of balance, more of a sense of choice that you can cho choose to, to be home full-time as a full-time mother or a full-time father that you, know, that you have more of a choice or you can have a career that balances. And I think a lot of employers do allow that, do have a lot of time, more time for family, whether it is for, you know, a, a father or a mother, I think we're much more aware of that than we were, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So I guess that's what I would hope for my daughter is uh, the choice and balance. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what do you think, like, you know, the fact that there are more um, strong women protagonists and oh, in media and, you know, as Grace said, like a lot more media products are passing the Bechdel test now. Well, what impact do you think that will have? I think that's all positive. I think it's to, to see women out there doing these things and doing them well and having those role models is is very important for, for the young women growing up now. You know, I, I want them to be able to go to movies and, and, and not think, you know, the women only talk about men. That's crazy. And it's, it's refreshing to hear Regina say that, you know, she doesn't really sense that anymore um even though i, I think to some extent it, it, it still does exist but yeah the, the the more that women are shown in many different lights the better you know one of the things that i appreciate that is changing this doesn't have a lot to do with literature but it has a lot to do with the perception of women as a whole and we I think came to age at the very height of photoshopping <laughs> madness. And I think that that pendulum is swinging back where a woman is not objectified as only one ideal beauty. And that, um, because I think that was incredibly damaging to a lot of young women for several decades to think that you weren't allowed to have a vein or a freckle or a wrinkle or a, you weren't allowed to be human. You weren't allowed to. And your value is a hair. Or... Right? Right? Your hair had to be perfectly soft and perfectly smooth. And um, 
it was all of these lies that that we were told a thousand times over silently a day by everything that we saw. And I feel like that pendulum is swinging back for my daughters. And I feel, I feel really good about that. Um, one thing that I hope will change for them as they get older is honestly objectification of women. And I think, I think there's still a huge portion of literature, film, media that the purpose of telling a story is about the sexual experience. And so I think it reduces women down to objects. And I, I think that I think that men did that for a really long time in history. I think in a lot of ways, modern women have jumped right in and joined. Um, and I hope that there is a day where we are more than our bodies and we are more than the face that people see and the hair and where we really are. There's a different standard for men and women. And men are allowed to look the way they look and women are supposed to pluck and tweeze and fix and makeup. And um, I, I would appreciate a day when we're both just completely accepted in our natural state of beauty as we come. Good point. And I think it extends to so many other things and that uh, viewing each other with empathy and appreciation for who we are, you know, just who we are is yeah. so important on so many levels. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any audience comments or questions? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, my next question, if nobody else has one, but add them to the chat because my next one's kind of short. Oh, someone's got one, a hand raised, Nancy. Do you want to type it into the chat or feel Hi, free to unmute? I, I, it might be easier just to talk. <laughs> I had like a toddler climbing over me. So I was like, oh, I think I'm just going to talk. So I've left the room. But um, I, I work for an engineering company. Um, and recently, like we have a kind of diversity and inclusion groups. And one is uh, like a women's kind of champion group. And we have a book club. And it's so I was really interested to hear this panel. But one of the challenges I find is that we always have just, not just women, but just we have women in the book club, but I'm wondering how is a way or what are the panel's thoughts on how to encourage men or, you know, uh, gender neutral or just like a diversity mm -hmm. of people uh, to read yeah. the female led? Cause even different cultures are also adverse to like, oh, you know, I, I can't read that kind of book or whatnot. Because, so like, how do we kind of, as a, as a book club, it's always nice to get more participation, but like, we all love it. But how do we, how does, how to expand the, 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 the really interesting female led fiction to a diverse, more diverse, broader um, audience, I guess, is the question. Can I just give a quick amen to that, Nancy, because I think that's a really good point. And I think a lot of times when we, um, when educators are looking for a book that will appeal to classrooms, so males and females, almost always it goes to a male protagonist because women will like girls will accept that and they'll just and that's fine with them but if they are reading a book if they're reading Anne of Green Gables the boys are like eh. <laughs> right so I believe that that starts incredibly young honestly elementary age where girls can join this world but boys can't it's not it's not equal um and you would hope that as they <laughs> you would hope that that would be fixed with literature that is exciting and experiential and immersive to the point that the men aren't thinking about the gender of the characters as much as they're just involved in the story. I, you know, I think Hunger Games did that a little bit for young adults. I think that is a female character, but I think a lot of boys read that too. But it's it's hard to do 
I agree. I think that was a nice one. And it's hard because there's so much marketing of like, these are the books for girls and yeah. these are the books for boys. It's I a, think it's a great, great point. Um, I just, I think the only way you get time. around the men not wanting to read women's, I, um, I took a, a college class called girls books that, um, sort of went back and more critically looked at the, the books that, that girls read growing up. So the, you know, Cherry Ames and Nancy Drew and Anne of Green Gables and, and some other stuff. So I, I worked in the computer lab at the time. So it was all male coworkers and like me, um, and one other woman. So now I'm like, did she and I talk about things besides boys? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, I was reading A Wrinkle in Time because I was rereading it for the girls books class. And so they, my coworkers asked why I had it. And I said, oh, I'm reading it for my girls books class. And they said, that's not a girls book. I read that. So mm -hmm. because it was a classic, because they had had it as required reading in fifth grade or whatever, they didn't think of it as, so it's like Hunger Games. They don't think of it as that. So if, the, if there's some way to revisit the classics or to maybe survey people and ask what's, what type of thing they want to read, what issues do you want to read about? You know, I, I'm trying to I'm basically advocating just tricking people. Um, but well, I think you had a good point, Greer, and the <laughs> fact that they had read that book gave them ownership about it, no matter what the gender of the characters is. Mm -hmm. So maybe just getting people to read a book gives them that sense of ownership and belonging in it, if it engages them, right? We've got another question um, as regarding historical fiction. What is your starting point for finding your protagonist? For example, do you start with a historical period, an individual, or a historical event? I'm quite excited to hear what you guys have to say about this. Do you want me to read it again? Did, are you able to see it? Well, for me, it's, it's sort of all of the above. Um, Sometimes I just hone in on um, a particular character in history that just fascinates me. And that's what happened with the engineer's wife. I found that story and what she did. And, and then, you know, the setting sort of came with her, you know, and, and it all followed from that. Uh, but other times it's sort of an, an era, a time frame I wanted to write about. Um, I wanted to write about nursing because of my background's in nursing. So I wanted to find, find an amazing nurse and I wanted to write about a time frame that, uh, that wasn't written about so much. You know, there's lots of wonderful, wonderful books about World War II, but not so much about World War I. So secondly, I picked um, a time era and then I picked, okay, well, where? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I really like France and Belgium and, and, and Europe. So then it was a matter of finding a character that did amazing things within those parameters. So, but it, but it, you know, it, it's different. It, it, it's usually, but a, a combination of those things, the setting, the time frame you want to write about and uh, the, the character or you know, perhaps the, the, the issue. And interesting what you said about like choosing a time frame and then looking for an amazing person. I mean, really when you, when you look, it's not hard to find amazing people. <laughs> they're, they're, there's more than we think, which is pretty right. incredible. And an amazing person that we haven't heard of a whole bunch of times. That's the other thing I like. I want to find someone that, that we don't know about, about stories that have, have been uh, not, not discovered, because that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. What about, I keep, oh, go ahead, Greer. I was just going to say, I keep stumbling across really people, really interesting people in my research. So I started out writing about well, I tried to write about a fictional, fictional situation because my first historical novel, The Magician's Lie, is about a, a female illusionist who um, cuts a man in half as part of her act because I had heard, we've all heard countless examples of, of male magicians cutting women in half, but nobody ever talks about women cutting men in half. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, primary is that, that no female magician made that her trademark until the 1980s. But I didn't want to write a book set in the 1980s. Um, and I didn't want to write a contemporary magician book. So I had to go back and, and start searching history for examples of when it would have been plausible to have a, a female illusionist on stage at a in sort of a golden age of magic. Um, 
but ever since then, so that book covered sort of 1880 to 1905. And ever since then, I keep stumbling across ideas sort of in that area. I stumbled across Kate Warren. I stumbled across um, the story of Nellie Bly going into the insane asylum uh, and pretending to be insane so that she could, um, you know, expose the conditions. Um, and then the Arctic Fury, I had read great stories about the Franklin expedition, really, really interesting stuff, but they didn't represent much of a female perspective because there were no women um, for the most part on, on those ships. So um, then I sort of melded it with a few other real historical things going on that I will not um, talk about because spoilers, but um, I do... It, it's some of some of what Tracy was saying of merging a, a time and a person and a plot and some ideas that I'm exploring. Um, but for me, it's, it's happened pretty organically um, over the course of these books. Do you want to chime in? But if you don't have, if you don't want to add, that's fine too. I don't have anything too fascinating to add. I don't. I don't know how to answer the question of where did the characters come from? I don't, I don't know. I think it would be admitting schizophrenia if I told the truth. <laughs> so I just, I don't know. It's that moment where you meet someone and then a world appears and it just encloses you and it won't let you out. So I don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't have a method. I don't have a lot to add. <laughs> I, I will note, Jamie, we got uh, a question and a comment in the chat. Um, whenever you're ready, I just want to point those out to you. Um, oh, we did, okay. In, uh, okay. In terms of not just thinking and writing female-led fiction, but also seeking to publish it, I wonder if you all might speak to your experience of querying and submitting these kinds of works and existing as authors of these types of works in the broader authorial spaces slash writing industry. Does anyone have any experiences to share? I feel like you really write from the heart. You write what grabs you. And when I think about uh, the book that I um, that is coming out next week, I was just taken by moment in history an actual event that that occurred and I just went with it and went with my heart and wrote what I think if you're writing from your heart and what you're truly interested in and you've got good facts and you've done your research that you have something strong enough to send for in a query it's just writing from the heart and knowing the um, the characters and the the history of the time. It's really important. So I'll add that if if oh. I'll add that Go if ahead, what you love is women's stories, stories that center women, I would say you're in a good position right now to be querying, to be submitting. There are so many agents who are looking for it. There are so many editors. Um, it, in the grand context of it's always impossible to get published, but slightly less impossible um, mm -hmm. if you are writing, especially I feel like female historical fiction, the, the appetite for untold stories I think is huge. And, and there are agents looking for it. There are editors looking for it. Several of us are published by source books, um, which is constantly centering women's stories. And I love that about them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that um, if that is what you love to write, then definitely you're better off than say if, the, if there were some other um, much more niche thing that, that you um, wanted to write and publish. Um, but again, like I said, in the grander context of it's always impossible to get published. It's very hard. You have to have a very tough skin. Um, Except for, you know, there are some, there are some stories of people who, you know, sent two queries and sold in three days and made a million dollars. And it's just that that's, that's not the story that most of us have. So you need to be prepared for anything. Well, and it, and she has more than two queries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
And then as existing as authors of these types of works in the broader authorial spaces slash writing industry, I will tell you, I have so many friends now who are authors who write about women in history. Um, and it's this wonderful, warm network. Most of them I've never met in person, um, even before the last two years, but um, at conferences and doing joint events at bookstores and stuff, I just, there are so many people um, that I've gotten to know because they are authors of the same kind of thing that I am an, an author of. And these women here, <laughs> we know each other through the, these networks of, um, you know, of, of author fellow feeling um, and publishing is so wacky. It really helps to have people who know um, what you're going through <laughs> at any given time. So reason to be optimistic there. Mm -hmm. And I would, would also question, I, I agree with everything that Julia and Greer have said, um, and write for your heart. And uh, I mean, don't write for the market necessarily, though, even even though, yeah, I think women's historical fiction is is pretty, uh, I don't know about hot, but it, it's, it's, it's pretty warm right now. But that, that changes. And by the time, you know, if you're submitting a book now, the time, by the time it's going to be published, you're talking maybe two, maybe three years down the line in the market can really change by then. So even more important to, to, to write the story of your heart, right? You are going to be with these characters for a long time. You're going to be in, in their world, writing about them, thinking about them, writing, editing over and over again. You better love that story. You better have passion for that story because, and you're going to have to sort of do battle with it to, to get it out there. Even if you're one of those, you know, one query out and uh, even then there, you, you're always going to be your, your story's um, most strong advocate. And that's just getting it to publication. Afterwards, there's, you know, there's a, you know, getting your story out there, getting it to the market, getting, uh, getting it to book clubs, if it's a book club kind of book. Um, but I, I have to echo what Greer says. Uh, in women's fiction, at least, because you know that's also my experience. Is there's such a wonderful network of of authors, and you might think, you know, I guess basically we're co competitors, and and I think in other businesses it doesn't exist that way, but authors and women's authors, uh, women authors, I would say specifically stick together and help each other and are each other's beta readers and strongest supporters and, and cheerleaders. And uh, you, it, it's a really important network and you can start building that right as you're, you know, right as you're beginning in those early, early baby stages. If you're still just trying to find your story, start, start building your tribe. It's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tracy. That's really great, great advice. We have a couple more things in the chat, and I just want to make sure we get to everyone. Uh, Emily has a comment for us, and she said, I think it's great that people are able to express their sexuality. However, society has over-sexualized women, and it's gotten to a point that women are just reduced to objects. We need to find a balance because women are worth more than their bodies, and men are usually not sexualized as much. Thanks for your thoughts, Emily. Uh, we also have a comment from Brandy. And she says she likes the idea of seeing more friendships and groups of women in fiction. It seems that we see a lot of women who are isolated in their cast. And when I saw your comment, Brandy, I immediately thought of Little Women, which is a story about a group of women and it just has such lasting resonance. And I wonder if that's why. You know, like I think, I think people connect with that in a really strong way. Uh, Lana has written and she says, how do they hope, oh, how do we hope that uh, our books help women become better leaders in society. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I think by the examples our protagonists set, you know, if our protagonists are out there doing brave, amazing, uh, ch world changing things, that's uh, they're being role models for, for our girls and, and young women. That's, uh, I, I think that's the, the best thing that we can do. Good point, good, good point. And you've reminded me that there are so many inspiring women out there today and yesterday, and there will be more inspiring women and inspiring people tomorrow. And so uh, I think if we have an inspiring mod model, it's easier to write something that can make a difference. 
Um, are there any teen YA books about strong women history you could recommend to a younger reader? That's the one that had me stumped. I've been sitting here like mentally reviewing my bookcases and I could give you, yes, examples of strong female protagonist for young adults, but I couldn't think of any uh, fictionalized biographies that were just coming to mind right away. I know Jenny Walsh has a book about Sybil Luddington. I'm not sure if it's, she's the one, the, the teenage girl who did a Paul Revere and, and spread the word to, to gather the militia actually during, during, um, during the Revolutionary War, I think. Um, but check out Jenny L. Walsh. I'm not sure if it's MG or YA, but there's definitely that. Um, and I haven't read it, but it sounds amazing. Kip Wilson has a novel in verse about Sophie Scholl, who was part of the White Rose resistance movement uh, against the Nazis. Um, and it's it's intense because Sophie does not survive the conflict. Um, so it depends, it depends on that age. So younger reader, that may be too um too intense for them, but there's definitely, there, there's definitely a lot out there. I'm just trying to think of what a good source would be that I could point you I to. I mean, there's always the diary of Anne Frank. Um, this year, my daughter read one called Girl with a Musket, and that was a true story about a, about a girl who masqueraded as a male soldier in the Revolutionary War. Um, yeah. There's a blog called A Mighty Girl. I, I can't think of the author's actual name, but but she blogs ex pretty extensively um, under the name A Mighty Girl, and and she comes out with wonderful lists for all those age groups and uh, adults as well. But that's definitely worth checking out. It's perfect. Emily commented, "How about Jane Eyre?" And I love that one. And I know people think maybe not for young readers, but I read it in grade seven, so more than middle grade, but uh, I love that. And it was always interesting to me to find out as an adult that some of the contemporary criticism of Jane Eyre was that it must have been written by a man because her emotions were so rational and complex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely for teenagers <laughs> and older people. Yeah. And I really like too that the book series, yeah, the book was made and also the other books, um, similar books were made by her sisters. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that, you know, it yeah. wasn't just Charlotte, but like the other sisters and that for a while they had to write with pen names and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wild, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thanks for suggesting that, Emily. Uh, we have one more question from Nancy. Uh, what, the, what do we think about female-led fiction and whether it helps to reduce unconscious gender bias tendencies for readers? I hope so. I just, Ray, I think exposure is everything. And the more familiar you become with something, the more you have opportunity to appreciate it. So I would hope that every time somebody meets a really fascinating female character that just unconsciously that becomes part of their catalog of what a woman is. Well, we're just about done. Uh, does anyone else have any more thoughts that are burning to get out? Does anyone have a, a book recommendation that they'd like to share? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> read everything, read every moment, have a book in every room, have a book always with you. So if you're, um, or on your, your Kindle, so if you're sitting in the doctor's office waiting forever and ever, you know, the, you always have time to read is making the time. And I, I tell people frequently, like, how do you have time to read and write? And like, well, you know, 
I don't really watch TV and that saves me probably a, an average of about two hours over, I think a lot of people, the, okay. the time is there. It's a really important thing to do, read. And I'd like to say bust out of what you typically read. Um, I know a lot of people who only read nonfiction or people who just read fiction. And I think we should be reading across um, across the lines. We should be reading a, a little bit of a good sampling of everything. Currently, right now, I'm reading the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, who just uh, won the Pulitzer for her work on that project. And, you know, it's opening my eyes up to all kinds of things that I didn't know before, even though I love a lot of nonfiction. I'm just um, really enjoying hearing this strong voice talk about women and gender diversities and, and, and all the disparity uh, that's gone on in, in the world uh, today. So it's, it's fascinating. Just read outside the box, try something new. That's really excellent advice, Julia. I, I think we could all, all stretch ourselves a little bit. And, you know, as we talked before, uh, once we read that book, that becomes part of us. We can understand a person in a new way. We can be someone else for a little while. And, and what a gift that is. Um, if there's no more audience questions or comments, we'll sign off. There is actually, Charles. sorry, someone has their hand oh. up in the audience, uh, Nancy. Okay, thanks for catching that. Thanks, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so one thing I find is I love to sit down and read a book, but sometimes I don't always have time. Um, mm. But I find I'm able to absorb a lot more if I'm, listening to like an audio book and whatnot. Um, I guess with kind of busy times with juggling like family life, work life, life life, um, like I do find audiobooks help. That tends to kind of restrict the books that I tend to sit down and read. But um, mm -hmm. I guess with female led fiction and whatnot, is there, like is there usually a lot of, I guess with regards to formats and whatnot and kind of marketing and whatnot, like is there kind of reaching the most audience? Is it, what kind of formats are kind of reach the most people do you find? Or like, I guess just talking about different formats, like with technology and whatnot, like how's to reach like the greater audience um, kind of thinking outside the box. I like audiobooks just for my life, but mm -hmm. like there's eBooks, there's Sounds book like books. it's a great fit for you now. Yeah, uh, exactly. I know I audio books are really great, especially for neurodiverse populations, right? Like if you have ADHD, it's a lot easier to engage in a story if your hands are busy or if you're driving or doing something else. Yeah. So I was just wondering with the panel, like what are your thoughts on kind of different formats and how does that kind of play into the story or, you know, add some music? I don't know. <laughs> That sort of thing. Well, I'm, I know I'm grateful to Sourcebooks because Sourcebooks believes in uh, as many formats are out there, they'll do. You know, we, we ha I've had hardback, trade paperback, uh, digital, and audio for, for my books, for both of my Sourcebook books. And it makes a huge difference. And, and uh, I, however people want to hear the stories or read the stories is wonderful. And it's, and it's so amazing that we have all these, these different things. I'm, I'm not an audio book person because I tend to kind of stop whatever I'm doing and, and listen. And so it kind of defeats the purpose of doing an audio and being able to do other things. <laughs> Cause I'm like, mm. and I, I really like the whole, you know just holding the book, um, but digital is also wonderful cause I can have like a hundred books with me wherever I go. So I, I think it's really in, important if possible to have your book as a writer to, to come out in, in all the different formats um, and la large print too. That's, that's huge as well. Um, the, the, really, the more, the better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as authors, we're not always in control of that. You know, the publisher might decide to do an audio book or not. They, you know, they might decide to do just paperback and not hardcover. Also, um, as a reader, I've got everything all the time. I always have at least one audiobook, at least one ebook, and at least one paper book going because I need them for different purposes. Um, and when I really love a book, I will get it from the library both uh, in audiobook and ebook so that I can, 
read it at different points in my day, you know, listen to it while I'm on a walk and then also read it at bedtime. Um, two very different things, but yeah, as an author, if you can, if you can get it out in the most possible formats, there's always somebody who needs one of those large print is in, included as, as Tracy said. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it was interesting to hear feedback. <laughs> Everyone's a little different for sure. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. It's been a treat to be together and to be with you. And thanks for sharing your time with us. And Charles, I'll turn the time over to you if there's any more messaging that we need to look after. Uh, no, just uh, thanks to everyone so much for coming out. It's been really wonderful listening to this panel speak and hear all their thoughts. Um, as I said, this the session has been recorded, and so once it's ready for posting, I'll send an email out to the participants. Um, some people couldn't make it tonight, so they'll get notified about that, and you can watch it again if you'd like. Um, and yeah, just uh, stay tuned for more EPL events coming out. This is the end of this is Jama's last event with us, so she did another event with us before, uh, and so moving on to another featured writer uh, later in the year. But it's been wonderful. Thanks so much for being with us, Jama. Thanks for having me. It's been yeah. so wonderful. It's been great, and thanks for organizing this panel event. It's been great. So um, I think that's just about it. So thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you. Thank thanks. you so Bye. much. Thank you for, for hosting. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.